All right, guys, welcome to the Strat Chat. We're here. This is the matchup everyone's been clamoring for. I want another one. I want to see the finals. This team versus BLG. If you guys watch that match tomorrow, holy crap, that team's playing at a very high level. Bin's essence, his aura is incredible. Knight, same thing. That team, if you caught our video yesterday, they have been emoting T1 icons in their wins since the first game of the season. They've been looking for T1. They want T1 to win this match. I guarantee you they're watching this gleefully, right? They, they have earned their right, and they can't wait to come up. But who's it going to be? We've got T1 and Gen G, the two most storied franchises in the history of League of Legends playing against each other. You could say the old and the new, although Faker is the only thing old about T1. He's got that four Ninja Turtles to, to which he's the Sensei Splinter, if you will. This team's looked fantastic. Guma Yusi has not died yet. Karia has been getting counterpick, all right? This metagame has been heavily playmaker dive-based mages like Silas, Akali, Yone, which have kept the Syndra and Orianna out a little bit because they have so much threat into those matchups, especially into side lanes, and these teams know that they can macro so well. There's a lot of things I want to get into for this game, but before we do, I want to give a huge shout out, and this is to every coach ever, doesn't matter what sport you're in, but especially the coaches in the West, the rhetoric that you're about to hear is exactly what you need to do when you're a coach. I'll go, I'll go through it and I'll talk through each moment, each answer, but we're going to listen in on Mata talking with Law. Welcome to the Verizon Game Day interview. I'm joined by Coach Mata from Genji to talk about everything that's been happening for the team last week. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much for joining me. I want to talk about what happened last week. Super nice touch, by the way. She does this every time she does an interview. She makes sure that she has something fresh in the language of the speaker so that you set them at ease and you show them, hey, I'm here for you. This is a fantastic step for all interviewers. Just want to give her props as well. Because obviously, no one expected you to go five games against FlyQuest. I'm wondering about the impact of you guys going... We thought they would go five games against FlyQuest, and we cited the exact reasons why. And if you guys want to see it, check out the video for game one. 3-0 in the group stage, in the Swiss stage rather, and having less time on stage to train afterwards. Uh, I mean, I can say there was an impact, I can't really deny that, but also we are pros, you know, I, I feel like that's just an excuse, so I want to say we underperformed and the opponents have a great preparation, so I think that was a combination of both things. Deflect any praise to your team and <clears throat> give as many compliments to your opponents as possible. FlyQuest did play great. They did prepare. They had a fantastic strategy, and your team was not there. And we, we know why, right? You had to watch T1 on Saturday, and you played on Sunday against a North American team. We get it. You, your players watched the Saturday game really caring about who it was, whereas FlyQuest had the liberty to say, okay, that's nice. That's next round. Let's focus on today. So they definitely came into that match sharper. What? Absolutely, and I want to reflect on something Lehans told me after the series. He was like, I don't know what happened after game one. It felt like we, we were making silly mistakes. We lost our League of Legends, from what he said. How did you refocus them as a coach? How did you make sure that they were able to, they were going to be able to focus on what they needed to, to grab the victory in the end? What was the mental process between the games? I love that she's so asking about mental. The bigger the stage or the stakes are, the lesser feedback I give to the players. Uh, I only. This is huge, guys. Make sure you listen to this and really absorb this. The bigger the stage, the less my impact is. You, as a coach, you need to find the singular one thing that your team needs to hear. And when the stage is big, First off, you can do some preparation about getting them into the mental stage. You can give them tours of the stadium. You can have them sit in the seats. You can have them, you can play music through the speakers that simulates the crowd. You can have the people image this, uh, just like Russell Wilson did for the Super Bowl. You can have your team prepared mentally, but if they're not there mentally, then that's the only thing you talk about. You just help them to lock in. You don't need to go over the specifics of strategy because that's past wh where they're at. Their mind is still stuck on the moment. You need to help them resolve that, and then you can go forward. 
bring out one or two like major mistakes that would have impacted the outcome of the game. But if that's something minor, I don't really bring it up. And also on that day, I felt like my per my players were not on their best form and their condition. So I focused on that to make sure that they can be back at their full condition. So one thing I figured throughout my world experience as a coaching staff, you know, uh, it's also important to make the players who are not doing their best or like underperforming to kind of make them become their best form again. So I think that's also an important part. And that part, right? It's the most important. If your players aren't playing their best, it does not matter. You can give them a major macro decision like, hey, look, they're trying to do this with the Rift Herald and we'll make an adjustment, right? But you give them that like bullet point, but you target all of your efforts into the psyche and you make sure that the team becomes ready for the moment. <clears throat> what we said was going to happen was exactly what happened. Flycrest would jump out to a lead each time that they would Genji would sharpen their mind and say, no, you're not beating us. And after FlyQuest would win two games, that Genji would lock in and say, no, we're the better players. We're never letting you off this stage. And that's when the ego comes out, the good kind of ego that says, I'm supremely confident in my abilities. No, I'm not letting you past me. That's what you need to unlock as a coach. And that's exactly what we're hearing from Mata. So it fits. You can see after a loss, they're not playing good. Let me just get you to play good. Let's not talk about strategies and and. What about Bwipo's counterpicks? Like, that stuff does not matter nearly as much as you play your best, you are enough. Keeping all that in mind, how do you make sure that they're going to be ready today? Uh, even in the previous quarters, I could tell that they were pretty nervous playing the match. So I wanted to make sure that I helped them feel more relaxed. You know, I was making some jokes for them to feel more, a lot more comfortable. I think, yeah, the coaching staff play a big role, but also I think Royals, it all comes down to the player. It's where the players are proving themselves. So I think it's them who has to prove themselves. So I think they have to overcome this by themselves also. And all I can do is trusting and believing in them. This is so key. You have to remember as a coach that the players have been dreaming about this. This is their best life. This is their dream. This is what they want. They've been thinking about playing in the semifinals or the finals against T1. Chovy has been dreaming about beating Faker and how, what it's going to look like. He's run this through probably a thousand times in his head, right? Ever since the first time he matched him, where he's like, man, this guy's playing mental games on me all the time. He ends up saying that later in their, in their interview. I think we'll see that. You, your job is not to change the way they are on game day. On game day, it's just sharpen the blade because they're the ones wielding it and they're the ones that need to cut through your opponents. Hearing this is absolutely fantastic. It's wonderful to see that people understand what the elite level coaching needs to be about. The preparation is in the bank. The tools are in the toolbox. Today, it's about being able to draw out your maximum power. And the stage doesn't get bigger than this. There's going to be some elements that you want to educate your team on. You might, you might want to prepare, especially the younger players like Pace, who's only 18. Let's not forget, even though he basically golden roaded. This crowd is going to be wild. And when they show Reckless, the team, the crowd is going to go bananas because Reckless is one of the most decorated, if not the most popular player in European history. So you can prepare your team for moments like this. Like, hey, they're gonna try they're gonna cheer 10 times louder for Faker and for Reckless than anybody else. <clears throat> be ready for that. <clears throat> be ready for that emotional surge that's gonna come through and be ready to just set your baseline where you want it to be. <clears throat> well, wishing you the best for today, Kwai Ting. Thank you so much for the interview. So that's what I wanted to share. This was a fantastic interview. I hope that all of the coaches in the West learned from this. It is absolutely not a train harder, work harder all the time, mentality that we saw for example from NRG last year when we intervened they were on the they were on the precipice of like what I th what felt like mental collapse they were working so hard and that's not it you can work less but with more intent and having a purpose every single day that you come and a goal in mind something that you're working towards and saying I'm getting better I'm enjoying the journey of getting better climbing that hill so that at the end I'll be able to see the summit that's what happens 
here. That's what we have a stage for. Uh, and I think there's no better time to, to check out the hype video. I'm gonna do this for you. We normally don't watch the hype video going into a match, but I want to give us an opportunity to build up the emotion, the way that the players will be riding it so that we can feel the way that they feel. Does that make sense? Here we go. Who will make it to the grand finals in London? They're pretty good at this, huh? Let's see. At the loot again. Michelangelo a dit, "J'ai vu un ange dans le marbre." Famous quote. J'ai seulement ciselé jusqu'à l'en libérer. Et tout comme il le dit, nous sommes nombreux aujourd'hui à travailler sur le marbre. Sacrifier tout sur son chemin pour réaliser son rêve. Le voyage n'est pas pour les cœurs fragiles. En 2019, Chovy affronte Faker en BO5 pour la toute première fois. Mais ne parvient pas à le vendre. Genji continua de gagner à domicile. Ils étaient imparables. Le rêve d'être champion du monde. Imposant et le fardeau. Pour l'un, le 
fardeau de rester au sommet. Pour l'autre, le fardeau d'atteindre le sommet. Toby Tonsu, Mirel Wanandaman, Ching Mia Wasi. Mugo Wangban and Muge, Hamke Chimoji is me. I'm hyped. <laughs> um, that's got to be the best type video I've ever seen. My goodness. Uh, we are the past, present, and future. Worlds is where we shine brightest. Area. It's like are absolutely unreal. Going into this, that's that's the sort of hype. Like what what you and me are feeling right now. This is what they feel all week. And then it gets ballooned into almost, you know, unimaginable heights for when they actually get on stage. And the team that's able to prepare for it better, the team that's able to react, will be the one that comes out playing sharper. It's, and that's the role of the coach. That's the role of what, what they do to sharpen their mind to get ready for this moment. I absolutely love this match. I can't wait. This is the best world championships that we've ever had. So uh, let's get to it. All right, can you get more hyped than that? I can't. I'm, I'm peaked right now. Talking about the games, all the champions in here, obviously Faker and Chovy, the legacies here, everyone knows about these. Uh, Chovy having broken so many records, worldwide dominance, people regard him as the best singular player. Keria had an amazing quote in there. At Worlds is where we shine brightest. And, and we talk about game theory optimal on, on this channel. You, if you have an ace up on up your sleeve, you don't throw it on the first hand. And it might be super tempting to throw it in a spring championship. But the spring championship, it's not actually, that doesn't even matter. Right? You're going to go to MSI anyways. At this point, it doesn't matter. It's not going to do anything. You do, that title is not the one you care about. If you have an ace up your sleeve, you're going to save it for the world championship. You're saving it for right now. That is the privilege of the crown when you're the best and you know that you're the best you can wait to save that biggest punch for the key moment where it's going to land because you don't want to throw it and have it be deflected and then have your opponent know it's coming you want to be able to throw it and know that you're going to end the fight when you do so i'm super pumped to see if t1 comes up with any amount of innovations coming into this series chovy if the future is yours prove it oh my god that's so good rest of the team though People talk about the future. It's not just Faker on this team. There's four young players. These guys want the future just as badly. They did win last year. This is a team that had to go through the crucible this year, playing through DDoS attacks. They could not practice for several months this year. Imagine how hard that would have been. And then to have your fans, people who don't know about that, criticizing you because you're playing worse. And it's like, well, yeah, we're playing worse, but you can't ever say that because then they'll just pile on and be like, oh, they're mentally weak. There's so many things. This team has been forged in the crucible. They're going to come in as the stoutest returning champions. And we've seen that in form. Guma has not died. Harry has been playing with counter picks. They've been going through the map, matching what the opponent's doing, turning and saying, no, we're going to turn your jab and punch right back. Always counter punching, always fast tempo. 
it's not always about the play you want to make. It's the play that we want to make. And if you do something that we don't like, fine, we'll go do something else. And that's okay because we know where our strengths are going to be. That is the glory of T1. That's why they tend to always have the advantage over Chovy. I will say that if I want to win as Gen G, I want Chovy to say I am, I'm going God mode. I want to prove that I'm the best player in the world. The only way to do that is to beat you. And when I say beat you, I mean force you to submit. That is how badly he wants this game. And we've seen that at times. If you remember the Michael Jordan Bulls, when they finally got through the Pistons, when they got to the Lakers, it was like a crowning serve. Like they were just so ready to dunk on everyone, sweeping the Pistons, going 4-1 against the Lakers, crushing those teams that were supposed to be the perennial champions. When you find your form and then you find the dedication to resolve that against your opponents, that's when the special level comes out. And that's why we... All right, let's check out the game. Early starts going out, we see wards and recalls. So you see that they go out and they show their faces. This is meant to be an exploitative change. You want to see how your opponents react to you leaving. We also see Silas picking up a sweeping lens early on. This is still in the 14-18 world where you get experience for killing wards. And that can be the difference between hitting some uh, level break points. Namely, level two is one that you can get early on in the game. But now without the ward, he's saying, you know what? I'm not even looking to push out in this lane. I'm going to let you push into me. I'm going to grab sweeping lens and stop you from going to invade my jungle. And uh, I mean, uh, this is a hype matchup. We're getting Chovy versus Faker and we're getting Yone versus Silas to go with it. Silas going to be able to pick up the Ash ultimate. T1 actually ended up with Ash and Yone in this draft, which is probably the two best in slot champions at their roles. We have Ash as the B1 pick and uh, <clears throat> Renata as the best pairing to go along with it. So we absolutely love this T1 draft. Uh, Zay is happy to play. I'm not going to say second fiddle, but a supportive role. He's going to play weak side against this Renekton. He's just going to mitigate. We've seen Ash against Renekton in lane swaps, right? And one of the things that Gragas offers in a lane swap meta that Renekton doesn't is Gragas is stable. Gragas is able to act and react in the face of lane swaps and still get more resources because of the kit that's available. So right now you're going to see Pays picking up the gold. It's much more important to get the scaling gold onto your AD, or well, in this case, AP carry. But you're going to try to get as much gold as you can onto those sources. Keen zones out Gragas as much as possible, try to deny him for a little bit of XP, and then teleports up top. Uh, this is an adaptation. This is not what we've seen, but we had a fast push from T1. That gets answered with a teleport right away. Now we're going to go 2 or 3v1 versus Gragas, but Gragas does hit level 2, so he's going to be okay against this dive. They may try to set it up. They are stacking this wave, but again, Gragas gets to chip down a wave much more than other champions. He also gets to pick up that can. Well, we'll see if he gets the cannon. Oh, dodges out the E from Leona. Or did he? Surviving this long is already a win, guys. And look at Skarner. Oh, he was he was threatening the flash there. Zeus would have flashed. He knew that he was going to force out the flash in return. Now a flash in response. Guys, Zeus is clapping this game. How to survive a turret dive. 101, not 101, 601, 614. This is the most advanced course that you're going to see. This guy is obviously prepared for it they knew going into this game hey we want the strongest champion into this lane swap we saw some strengths from FlyQuest, some moves that genji was not able to capitalize on and we're just going to put gragas down here and they're going to catapult to an enormously they should be able to snowball this game from that position All right if there's going to be a downside it's going to be that this skarner is going to be almost impossible to kill in the late game guys look at this team it's vi yone ash Gragas, there's only a little bit of AP. You can go an AP build here on Gragas, and you might even feel comfortable doing it against Renekton, saying, you know, I can always belly bop you out. I'm never really caring about this. Hold on, level threes versus four, solo experience, but here's the Ash versus Renekton conundrum. If you do not kill me, I am going to whittle you all the way down. When we talk about these plays and what Gragas can do and whether or not he ends up going for tank versus AP, almost always it's going to be tank at this level. It's just much more valuable to have another person that can be that vanguard for you in the front line, especially since you're trying to set up some sort of dive with Ash Arrow, Yone, Scoop, and Vi Ultimate. Then Gragas can go and peel off the rest of the fight. And that's all you need to do. Say, I'm going to isolate this fight. 
Let's turn it into 5v1 to start. And then after our cooldowns are down, I want to disperse your team. So now it's five versus the two stragglers on one side while the other two never come back into the fight. That's the idea behind the composition. Renata's gonna make sure that there is no collapse afterwards. She can just cast a zoning ultimate, having the most one of the most powerful ults in the game, especially when she hits level 11. And they should be able to control these fights. The problem will be if they can't ever get through this Skarner. This team is 3 AD, and even though you have Armor Breaker from the Vi, and we might see a Black Cleaver somewhere to go along with these 3 ADs, there even once upon a time, if you guys remember, there was a Blade of the Rune King, Black Cleaver, like Runon's Hurricane build. Hold on. Getting a good chunk here. Uh, that Ash used to play when you wanted to play truly like supportive. Most times we're seeing Kraken Slayers and Phantom Dancers here because they want the Ash to actually like rip into the fights. Ash does a tremendous amount of damage ever since her Q was buffed, whatever it was, three times in a row. She's been an a, exemplary carry. Kind of giving the best of all worlds where she deals tons of damage. She can set up for your team. She has Hawkshot and, and she can kite. Like what, what else could you want from a carry, right? Especially in this sort of supportive bot lane meta where you're supporting the carries from mid, then you know that's where Ash is truly gonna shine. Level sixes are coming in. We haven't seen any moves for the pits yet. I expect the team fight team to want to go for dragons. They're going to try to scale up this way. I want T1 to go to the void grubs and then try to set up their siege power. Ziggs is the best anti-siege champion from that position in the game. The problem will be if they ever get their hands, if T1 gets their hands on a Baron, what does Gen G hear? So, Largely what this play for the for the grubs is, is saying, okay, we're going to play to pull you apart and choose when to come back together and see if we can pull you apart, come back together enough times, move around with our expert tempo, the way that we've been notoriously you know, famous for doing. And if we ever get barren, the game just ends. The only way out is for you to take an all-in fight where Skarner, Renekton are just going to have to dive bomb, on, dive bomb on top. Silas is going to have to grab one of these engage ultimates and follow through with Ziggs spraying and praying. And that's it. So that's T1's game plan. That's Genji's answer. They'd like to never let it get to the Barons. They want to get strong enough by this like 22-minute break point. They'd like to have two items and boots, uh, especially on Ziggs, Silas, and it probably won't be on Renekton because of the low economy here maybe Skarner gets a little bit further ahead especially if he's allowed to just continue guarding the lanes while continuing to farm buys the onus is on Vi to make more proactive plays here and Skarner can continue farming a little bit more just being in the presence but Vi has more mobility she'll be uh, clearing through these camps a little bit faster going a little bit more damage or can expect her to stay ahead on the curve here Skarner is going to be rushing that heart steal, and he's going to be in no rush to, to take tons of fights. You can make a lot of plays, but after that bot lane dive did not work, thanks to Zeus expertly flashing. And honestly, he looked he looked so comfortable. He looked like he didn't care. Like he wasn't spam clicking. He's just like, all right, I'll move here. What do you got? Okay, I'll flash here. All right, I'll belly bop here. It's he was just waiting for the opponent to move. Make make them make the first move, Conway. When they make the first move, then you can exploit. You can say, all right, the answer to that is this. Let me counter your move with my move. And that's his job. That's his weak side job this game. Whatever you guys go, wherever you try to go, I'm going to go plug and play. So notice Gragas. He's going to go pick up the top side. You already have a carry in both of the other lanes. Gragas will be the safe guy to go on the weak side of the map. Now, we spoke about this with the FlyQuest game. We call this Pendulum Macro. Right? And it's not a perfect name, but it's what we call it. Pendulum macro is the idea that you go side to side on the map, and wherever your jungler is looking to go is where you're looking to push, and then you go weak side on the other side. Right, So Gragas is going to plug up this top side while Vi goes for an invade, and to coincide with the invade, the support hovers to the right, you get a push in mid and a push in bot. So they say, hey, look, we are exceptionally strong on this side of the map. We can take one more camp, or we can take one more plate or we can push for a turret. Whatever it is, there's always a gain to have. Now look for them to swap, right? The wave is gonna come back, Ash is gonna sit all the way back, expect them to trade. You see these two recalls, 
buys on this side of the map, she gets to collect her camps. They might even move Yone here and put Ash here. Because Yone's moving first, that means that he can go up to the camp. This is perfect. Well done, T1. This is what we talk about, right? This sort of move allows this sort of move. These two moves are shorter than asking Yone to just sit here doing nothing and watching Ash go all the way over here. So beautiful macro to start off from T1. This unlocks more resources on the map. You notice that they did not give up a single wave. Because they were strong here, they were able to crash this wave. Yone was strong here because of the support. Weak side is fine. He goes and recalls. Because he was weak side, Gragas' wave will be the first one that crashes. So Yone pushes his wave and comes over and collects it. So every time you do this, you essentially gain a wave on any opponent who does not. If they're not moving in this fashion, you are going to pick up those extra minions that the enemy team sometimes gives up. So beautifully done from T1. We see that they are exacerbating this lead. Growing, proliferating. Focus on the Void Grubs. They're here on time. They've already got Zombie, zombie Ward 2 controlling the area. Expect them to take the first one with no smite. Uh, owner's got this one. He wants to save it for a contest. Skarner might go in and try to just pick up one. There's a little trick where you can just kind of pass through here, top of the wall, and look for a smite. Uh, he may or may not try to do this, but they're going to go two Void Grubs and just step back. And now say, we're moving first. You're reacting to us. Just like with the Pendulum Macro, we can reset. We, need, we can get ourselves good in a good position. Oh, okay, you want to come forward? Fine, we'll fight you. Renekton's on just a Phage and Boots, guys. He is very, very vulnerable. And Skarner just put his smite on cooldown, which means slight advantage here. But they do get the kill on Vi. You can tell that T1 wanted to let them get the Void Grub, then use the smite as an additional offensive resource using Gragas ultimate plus the Renata bailout as a way to try to get a kill that would keep Owner alive. If they had gotten that, they would have blown out the entire fight. As it is, Genji plays it nicely, ends up getting a grub for themselves. We didn't have the full throttle power of, of T1 there. So the other benefit that they get for themselves is while Gen G has to go and recall, the carries get to go back into the waves now. We'll keep an eye on the player cams whenever we can to see if there's anyone with obvious nerves. Garner did go for a big peel there. Interesting play of Gragas versus Skarner. You can redirect. And when he goes for that big pull, and you can say, hey, like, okay, pull, pull my guy back to me, please. We'll see if that ever comes up. Chovy finally getting access to plates. T1 missed a little bit on the rotations here, but it looks like they are opting to just give this up and go for a dragon for themselves. Make sure that there's not an endgame condition at 24 minutes. For Soul, they get a dragon for themselves. The t first two dragons, very easy to take. Every dragon that you take is a 7% debuff on yourself for taking any future ones. It's fewer damage that you deal, and it's more damage that the dragon deals to you. It necessarily makes it a little bit harder. So Genji saying, we're going to exploit your play. You guys want to play for a weak side Gragas. We're actually going to overload this side, making it so he can't even show up. Looks like Gragas is just looking for some chunk damage. I maybe would have saved that to stop recalls, uh, but we're looking for trades. They end up making a play for first turret, and they get it. By pushing up top with the teleport, they say that was the key. And that's why Gragas tried to pull them away. Maybe by getting the minions away would have, might have been a better job at, at stalling the turret. Like going by the wayside in mid lane. We do see that it's going to be Cosmic Drive, pro probably into Fimble Winter and going tank from there. Usually Gragas just goes for one AP item, but we have seen them go Seraph's Embrace. And especially in this game, like we mentioned, triple AD with like a tiny amount of magic damage, a tiny amount of magic damage, and like we're not even going to consider Ash's arrow as magic damage. It might be a world where Gragas needs to deal an explosive amount of damage. The problem with that is that this guy is going to go Heart Steel plus Merc Treads. And he's going to be stacked up. In fact, he already has it. This is never going to die to a Gragas. He's got enough HP. Anytime that your opponents have just one source of damage, you can go for an itemization that is health to counter the one source of AP and then resistances to cover the other. And that way you end up with your multiplicative health times resistances. That's how you get your maximum effective HP. But because Gragas is on a essentially one cycle combination, he's never going to be able to chew through this. It will be, it will be problematic for T1 
to fight for space this game. This Skarner is already threatening. They don't want to give him extra stacks, but it looks like they're trying to corral him here, but they have late recalls. So uh, they're saying, hey, we can do this on spikes, but we're behind on spikes, right? We just have these. Look at all these. They're all done already. Skarner, in fact, is even bigger with the completed Merc Treads. So it looks like they're going for a little bit of a harass, trying to corral the other team here. Are they going to use it just as an opportunity to try to hold this area? See and engage. I don't like this window. Why did we give them a window? Carrier, that was a huge mistake. They must have had some sort of play on, some sort of predicted like, hey, we think that they will do this motion and we can capitalize on it by doing X, Y, or Z. But it didn't look good. That looked really loose. So either there was a miscommunication or something happened where Genji adapted to the plan. It'd be good to hear from the coaches to see what they're looking at. Most of the time, a shallow defense, which is what we'll call that when you stay on your own beach and then you keep carries in the lanes, is meant to give your carries access to an extra one or two waves. And you put defenders there that are able to stall. The problem was that area can stall. He got jumped on. That kind of blows up everything because now... Now, not only are you giving them the resource, now you're taking away those spells, they get to take the Rift Herald, but also now you're off the map when your team needs you. You're supposed to be playing for strength coming out of that position. The entire team, enemy team, if they have five here, they need to worry about this avenue, they need to worry about this avenue. You can sort of corral them into playing very defensively for about 30 seconds after a big objective take. But you don't get access to that because once you're down a player, the other team says, all right, we'll just five-man move into whatever zone we want to. And it forces T1 to retreat a little bit and they try to come back. But proactive play on top gets answered by reactive play on bottom. Three-man defense, one-man push. This is, this is the recipe. Three people to go defend against five. Especially in the early game, the three are not very likely to die. Uh, the t damage totals just aren't there yet. You don't, you don't have the multiplicati multiplicative damage profiles and from the items and levels. And so Genji does well for themselves. And, and like in this game, when you have a Ziggs, all you need to do is get this structure down and it's down. So now this entire map, notice that all of this area is no longer defended by T1. They can only rely on this and there's nothing to defend here, right? There's, this is just base. No one cares about this spot. You've only got this area. So now Gen G is going to be able to play, plug and play and try to get into your face before every objective. And Skarner's just going to hold down territory. I don't see the answer that T1's going to come up with. How are you going to get past the Skarner? It probably just has to become a split push angle. And you say Yone is the alpha here. Yone will win against Silas. But it's, it's close. And it's close until, you know, late, late in the game. Maybe on four items. But even on four items, when you talk about Silas's time to death for Yone, he can lock him up just as well, and he can get access to the same ultimate to essentially chain CC, get access to two chain slayers. Like, it, this is not a be all and end all, like where Yone's going to win no matter what. You're going to have to find some sort of fight for yourselves. And going side lanes is also difficult because of what we just saw with Ziggs. Ziggs can park his butt in the mid lane. And from about this range right here, he can nuke that wave. And they basically never need to give you access to the turrets because Ziggs has permanent ability to kill the waves. I like this interim item before going for Seraphs. Sometimes we see people go straight up to Seraphs. We'd like to see this most times that it's applicable. You're the one dealing a lot of splash damage. You're the one dealing a lot of uh, chunk damage at the start of fights, and you're responsible for clearing waves. So if you're the one just throwing out the random spells, then yeah, like go grab this, give yourself a little bit of extra AP, and then you can go in, because it really doesn't matter. The Seraph's Embrace does not matter until you get there. Hold on, nice play. Renata plus Ash combo right there. Locking this guy up. They're chain CCing the Leona. Now that is a lot of ultimates. Who are they trying to give it to? They're saying we're going to give it to Faker. Baker was trying to give it to Ash, and Ash says, no, you take it. I wonder if that's a moment of, of nerves or if they just really want to have him because they understand that he has to be able to go side to side on the map. Ironically, Ash is the one that picks up the bounty after that. This is the old bounty system, guys. So uh, creep score, difference in creep score is going to be part of the equation, but the kills 
Uh, there we go. Oh, and he lost it. All right, he had it, then he lost it. All right, how do we look at the rest of the game? Yone's going to feel really strong right here. He's picked up his Tiamat, and he's going for all the way. Is he going all the way in? He's like, yeah, I can take this. But Kenyon says, I'm going to hold you down. That might have been a little bit of an in. Look at what Renekton's doing from the flank. Team was calling that, hey, we have to pull you back. Uh, interesting. I don't want to say that, that a team might be tilted, but if Faker was trying to get Guma to take that kill, and then Guma says, no, you take it, then sometimes you might feel... A, that miscommunication, the, the channels have broken, but also, if, especially if you're the shot caller and captain for your team, if they're saying, no, you take it. I, again, it's a little bit of speculating, so I don't want to go too far into it, but we're taking a note. That we're definitely going to take a note of that, and that the immediate effect, if that were the case, then it is very easy to tilt. If you're the shot caller and someone doesn't listen to you, then suddenly the dynamic of, you know, who's actually making calls here might change and you might feel like you have to overplay it was neat that faker was able to get that turret he was sure that he was able to do it the team didn't realize that he had that power or they're saying no 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 we have to get back and he's probably saying just like support me like throw anything over the top here to try to get it the problem is obviously that they didn't have three of these ultimates and so they have to call to step back dying for a turret not the end of the world, but you are off the map for a while, and that means that Chovy is going to be the big winner there, uh, because also picking up a kill, he's going to be huge now. 101, 195 CS, he's doing exceptionally well for himself. We're going to start seeing Gen G posture for Baron, right? We said that they cannot let this Baron go. So Skarner Tech. So for the rest of the game, what I expect to see, weak side, weak side. These guys are going to be battling in this lane. They're going to be playing tug of war for that for that wave. Whoever can go further should be able to move first. We saw yesterday that one of the strategies was to try to just pin bin on Jax back to this corner and say, hey, like we're just going to keep you here. If you ever want to join a fight, we're going to force you to teleport in, and then we're going to move away from the fight. That is an, a very interesting play for these end games. Say, hey, can, can we actually like hold you down and make you feel like you have to come in as a teleport? It only really works for the Renekton. Gragas is happy to be the weak size, weak, weak side, just pick up the wave as it goes. You notice that he's not even forcing this wave down. He's letting the casters stay alive to kill as many of his minions as possible. And he's keeping the minion wave right here. He's saying, okay, nothing's happening. We're chilling. If I can sit here, you're not coming back over on this side of the map. In fact, right now, our team is looking to get to this side. So only now am I going to think about going forward, but I don't even have to. Hopefully he doesn't feel pressured. It looks like he opted to do it. He definitely just cleared out that, that next wave quickly. The idea being that he wants to get to the other side of the map. Um, but I don't know if that fits into what T1's trying to do. They're not trying to fight for this dragon. They're trying to fight for Baron. So that's actually what they do. Gragas pushes out the wave. I actually wouldn't have mind him, minded him keeping the wave here. He can, comes in and he's going to try to stone this area, right? Make it so that no one can come back over if they come from the bot lane without using teleport. And if you can get teleport from the Renekton, then you're talking about a four minute window that you can try to push and pull, tease the waves, try to get them into position to get where you're going. Skarner moving with impunity. Control word for control word. Notice that he's not going to take the time to take that control word down. Killing, killing wards tends to be a waste of time. You kill them if there's absolutely nothing else to do but as Skarner this game you better believe that they have something to do at all times in the game all right so here we go t1 is pulling the trigger looks like they're not bluffing Skarner's staying on the dragon which means that they're probably going to be able to take this in fact it's only now with the ziggs bomb that they realize that it's happening and he actually leashed the damage so they're going to be able to chunk this uh genji's going to look for the fight so let's try take it out They're not able to consolidate that kill. Gragas is trying to peel the, the Skarner or Renekton off to the side. He's keeping the tanks away, but look how, look how much of a distraction he's being for this Ziggs. We'll see if the rest of the team can just take this fight into the Skarner. But these are the strong members, and Renekton's about to get chunked if he stays in this. No, they end up getting there. All right, so they get that quick kill. This is what you want, Blade of the Rune King versus the Skarner. If you want to go Heartsteel on Skarner, then I'm going to go Blade of the Rune King on my carry, and I'm going to try to rip you apart. We get the Baron, they give the dragon, and now it's a race. 
how much can you get done in this window? Because if you don't get enough done, then you get forked for the next time where you're forced to consider defending Dragon while also wanting to take Baron. But we talked about how weak this Gen.G team would be into a Baron buff that they only have Ziggs for reliable wave clear and he just can't clear a wave against Baron. Good job by Karia kiting right here. Look at that. Beautifully done. Guma perfectly spacing there, making sure not to die even with the bleed from the Skarner. Beautifully done. Kicking off that fight. I love, I love Zeus's Gragas, guys. He's so good at this champion. He's like, no, no, you guys are going to come over here. Come fight the heavyweight right now. You know, yeah, like it's like Warrior Taunt in, Le in World of Warcraft. Like you're coming to me. Guma UC has still not died in this tournament, tournament guys. The key to winning on AD carry over any other role, you don't die. Rule number one, Kaisa. All right, four-man defense being played here. They're going to try to split apart. The question is whether or not you send Vi or Gragas into the other lanes. You do need to keep a reasonable amount of chunk here with your, with your pretty squishy bot lane. It looks like they're opting to match these together and saying, hey, I can go into a lane because I can then branch off and try to dive in either direction. Uh, absolutely, Faker's going to try to take these 1v1s, go, go for any amount of chunks. Uh, he does have access to Teleport and his ultimate if we get a second chance at it. Teleport is down from Silas, so we might even see Faker try to flex here and maybe go in for this fight. Vi might try to push this wave. This is an opening. Yeah, all right, so you see Chovy. He's moving over preemptively. He's saying, all right, we got to pick up this wave. I got to make sure that they don't make any more progress on this turret because we're going. But look what T1 is doing. They're saying, we're going to keep you in this defensive radius. We're going to put wards in your face for any try type of motion that tries to get past this. And we're going to chunk down your turrets as much as possible. Bobbing and weaving. Dance like a butterfly. Sting like a bee. League of Legends is like chess boxing. It's a little bit of both. Baker feeling himself going on in. Getting a good little chunk. Blade of the Rune King damage. They say, hey, we can go get this Skarner. Are you kidding? If they pick off Skarner with a 5v1, they can do it. Genji has to commit. That was 16 spells just got used. They're not going to give him the window, though. Leona missing a, a spell is crucial. Keen is not diving into the middle of them. That means they're just going to fall apart. They crumble to the pressure of the push. T1 gets everything that they wanted from that Baron. They get the Baron. They get the kills. They get all of the inners. And check out this gold lead now. Four and a half thousand gold. Hold on. We see the engage. No, just far enough. That would have been the window. God, would Faker would Faker have been able to live that down if they were able to catch that? Expertly baited, we'll say, from that position. They say, you know what? We're strong enough. We've got five people here. You tried to control the space with not enough support. Here we go. One of the things that we did see from FlyQuest. Watch this fight. Look at the spacing on the fight, guys. Uma UC does it better. Notice that he doesn't just kite away from the threat but he kites into the middle of his pocket of protection he's got three bodyguards renata side by side ready to bail him out he's got vi and gragas ready to control space in between yone who dives forward and comes back and then can be in the middle of that fight beautiful beautiful team fight positioning there the other element one of the other elements that the west just doesn't hold a candle to the east on and it's, honestly, it's because they don't practice it. They just scrim block, scrim block, scrim block. They don't, they don't buckle down. They don't buckle down and say, let's replay this scenario over and over and over and over. Play it in your minds, play it in your heads, play it on the whiteboard, right? Theory craft it. What would you like to have done? What can we do? What are the answers? That is what they're doing in the East. They're setting this up. They have a staff of coaches that will set the next computer up for another 5v5, and they will play that 5v5 in-house. I can't say this enough, in-house. They don't go and try to scrim block someone where in a scrim you're trying to win. You're, you don't need to scrimmage someone else. It's not about who wins. It's about what you're trying to get better at. And you can only do that in-house where you can trust that the, that the knowledge you're gonna get is useful to your team. All right, hold on. Chovy's jumping in the back. They may get the fight that they want right here. They're going for a pick onto Karia, but Karia's bailing out. If they get any kills here, they'll come back to life. It's not quite enough, but the chunks of damage are there. Guma is still spacing this fight perfectly. You see control wards in that bush. Ash is just so good, and no one does it better than this Ash. That's going to be game, guys. 
40 second timers they have the structures down they're going to go forward you've got two carries alive this is going to be gg uh can they tank they're going up to the top wave zeus should go up and tank for this he missed it no he yeah, you know what? he's kind of low i take it back they're pushing in two ways. They're actually spam pinging and they're actually communicating in two different directions. Again, a little bit of dissonance. You have to be careful now. This timing is a little bit tight. You've got the minion wave. You've got the voidlings. You should be able to finish it. You should grab up, grab the minion aggro. Gragas needs to body the Leona. Leona does not have access to her ultimate, but she will in eight seconds. It's just not going to be enough. So they end up splitting their calls. You see that they both had pings in different directions. I need T1 to make sure that they sharpen that up. This was a great game. They did exactly what we said they needed to do, getting that Baron and pushing it in. But you can tell that there's different people thinking different things. I need to make sure that they're better in game two. See you there.